When you become a believer, although you still have trouble in your life, you have peace and a sense of presence which lifts you above the world and keeps you safe. I know my life has been a journey of adventure and excitement and also many trials. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I was a Muslim. Now I am a Christian. Come join me as I begin this new life. What are Huda and Dr. Cynthia doing today? that we discuss, which is what is appropriate kind of clothing for Christians to wear. And you know, a lot of things there. Hey, Ahuda, show me something with uh, like little straps or really low cut that, uh, we, that are the styles now. I pull that dress out. See, there's just, yeah, there's just not much on the top of that dress. Hmm. Now show me something that's kind of modest to look at. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a little bit uh, low cut too. We'd have to try that on, but I think that's going to be low cut. It's difficult with the styles in America now. That one has a that one has a collar and short sleeves, so. So that would probably work for most occasions in the summer. Huda, are you spending money? Yeah, I'm spending money. <laughs> what did you get? Show us what you get. What did you get? I get. I'll show you what I get. Cowboy boots. Uh, cowboy boots. So now are you going to be a real American? Yeah, I want to be a real American. <laughs> All we have to do is find a horse and a cow and a uh, saddle, right? Oh yeah. Good. Okay, good. Let's go. Bye. The Christian life can be confusing for Muslims because when they look at America or the West, they think we are all Christians. 
So sometimes we get everything lumped into the idea of, well, Christians can do anything because Jesus forgives it all. So they can drink, do drugs, sleep around, misbehave. And at the other extreme, sometimes they say, well, if you have to do this, this, and this to be a Christian and you can't drink or you can't run around or if we try to explain why a Christian does certain things that might be called disciplines, they come to the opposite conclusion. And as one former Muslim told me, well, then if that's the way it is, I may as well be Muslim if I'm going to have to do all these rules. So we walk this border between total license and legal legalism. And this is what we need to balance in our presentation, how we can explain this to you former Muslims and as Christians, how we are trying to explain it. Here is today's lesson. To this segment of Questions Muslims Ask. Today, once again, we have with us Brother George Husni, a pastor, Bible translator, author, lecturer, discipler of Muslim background believers, and preacher to Muslims in at least four continents, probably five or six, I, give or take one or two. He's been doing this for 40 years, and I'm so glad to have him with us here today. It's been years I've been trying to get you. So now we have you and we've got all kinds of questions for you, but right now, today I would like to ask you something. Um, this is not necessarily a question that Muslims ask us when they become a believer, but we see it all the time. And that is, what do we do about rules? Because we know, you and I and our viewers out there, that Islam is a tremendous system of rules. And whether or not you go to heaven is largely based on how well you play the game, how many points you get by following the rules. And, and it, it, to some degree, has a lot in common with games or board games. So then when we have someone like our sister Huda and other Muslim, former Muslim women that we both know, they come out of Islam and they become Christians, we need to know how to share with them, are there any rules in Christianity? Do we have a dress code? How many times a day do we pray? If we read the Bible every day, is that going to make them think that they're, it's like having to read the Quran and having to pray? So I myself am very um, reluctant to give rules or guidelines, and yet if we don't, we know that when people leave their rules, they can just go the opposite extreme and we have some kind of chaos. They can have men in their room late at night because, well, you know, as long as I'm not doing anything bad, anything goes. And, and on and on, I, I could probably make a long list of things that I've seen and maybe you too. So what would you say to Muslims that are struggling with, now I'm a Christian, do I have rules? What you have brought up now is one of the most critical, most important questions in ministry to Muslims. Uh, because as I traveled, and you mentioned I've been everywhere, over a hundred countries, visited pretty much all Muslim countries, Arab countries, North Africa, Middle East, and I'm not just going as a tourist. I go and meet people who have come out of Islam, mm -hmm. and I see a lot of problems because of this issue is a lack of understanding. And the reason for that is that when they hear people like you and me preach the gospel and tell them about Jesus, we tell them you don't have to do anything to be saved. Because Jesus saved you. It's a free gift. You don't have to work for it. Not by works. Ephesians 2, 8. Not by works lest anybody would boast. It's by grace that you are saved. We say you can believe in Jesus and he and you will be saved. All you can confess your sin, all your sins are forgiven. So I have noticed that those who hear this kind of message think, ah, then I can throw out 
all of the rules, all of them, just throw them out, and they become free. I got a call one night from a policeman. He says, come over, I can't understand these people. So I went to translate for him. It was an Iraqi family. The, uh, the brother, 21 years old, was beating his 16-year-old girl, uh, sister. And the neighbors heard the screams, they mm. called the police. I said, what's wrong? He said, look at her. She just uh, is wearing a miniskirt. So she told him, I'm a Christian now, I can wear a miniskirt. Mm. And the miniskirt was very offensive to me. It was very, very short. And she had always been covered from top to bottom. She comes to the States, she becomes a Christian, and now she can be free. And she's going out with the boys and with the girls, nightclubs and all this. And her brother says, what kind of Christianity is this? So I have actually been working with a lot of these issues, not just about dress, but even reading the Bible. You already said, the Quran is a requirement. You get mm -hmm. credit with God, we said. We get uh, thawab. You get, uh, uh, you know, uh, God uh, will be more pleased with you if you read more. If you read more pages, the more God is pleased with you. More credit like you put in your account, in the bank account, more money. So God will give you more credit there. We not, need not to, to teach this. So while we do not want rules, we need disciplines. In Arabic I would call it iltizamat. Iltizam. I need to be multazim, meaning discipline myself. And one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 is self-discipline, dubbed in nafs. We need to discipline ourselves, in a way train ourselves to learn the Word of God. The Bible is not something you have to read, but if you don't read it, you will not grow in your faith. Right. It's like food. Do you have to eat? I mean, is it like if, uh, if you don't eat, God will uh, you know, bring a whip and beat you and punish you because you're not eating? No, it's not a rule, but it's a necessity. If you do not eat, you're not going to uh, survive. Mm -hmm. You can stop eating for a few days or a few weeks, maybe 40 days, but on the 41st day you're dead. And the same with drinking. You can, you know, fast for a whole day, but you can't fast for three, four days without drinking. You can't go without breathing uh, oxygen, maybe three minutes, four minutes maximum, those who dive underwater or something. But you breathe because you need to live. You eat because you need to live. You need drink because you need to live. If you want to live the Christian life, you need to feed on God. You need to feed on the bread of life and on the water of life, Jesus. So we're dealing with G and Islam, you know, you had to pray so many times, fast, read the Bible. But what about things like how you dress and if you can drink alcohol, your relationship with the opposite sex, all these things which aren't really specified in the Bible. And once the, the uh, rules and the pressure is taken off of the outside, people might not know what to do. Frankly, for example, I work a lot with students on the universities, and what we see, especially with the guys, the girls are still more under wraps, but a lot of the Middle Eastern guys come to America and they go crazy because in the Middle East they have all this family and cultural pressure of things they shouldn't do, usually in the moral arena, but when they come to America they feel like, oh, I can do what I want now. So how do we keep new believers um, being circumscript or, or paying attention to what they should do in areas where they have freedom as far as liberty, about eating pork, drinking alcohol, dressing more Western. Do you have any guidelines on that? Definitely. The Bible is very clear about principles of life. The Bible is not about rules. There are rules in the Bible. And the rules in the Old Testament have disappointed people because they tried to obey God, tried to do all these things, found themselves failing. And that's the point. That's why Jesus came. Because He gives us His power 
to follow principles, not rules. For example, uh, we don't have a rule that you cannot drink. But that does not mean you drink all you want or all your body can take. Uh, the Bible tells us to not be drunk, although you can drink. So there's a rule there, do not be drunk. But the principle is, you have freedom. And use your freedom not as an opportunity to let your body want whatever it wants, the desires of the flesh, whether it's sexual or whether up in sex or drinking or any other passions. The Bible says that we have freedom, but don't use the freedom to, for licenses, meaning like liberty to do whatever you want. And the principle, the main principle is love. Principle of love. For example, if you're dressed in a way that hurts somebody else, you have the freedom, but you have violated the, the, the principle of love. Love others because you want to be also useful for others. You need to help other people live the Christian life. So don't be seductive. Don't do things that would hurt other people. Uh, but also in terms of dress and jewelry and so on, the Bible does talk about not being too fancy or too uh, worldly. Not just to get yourself so wrapped up in your beauty and your jewelry and your clothes that you forget who you really are, the person. Sometimes uh, the externals can cover the internals. Don't let the externals cover the internals. Let the internals flow out of you. The real person in you, the spiritual uh, man and woman that God looks at and pleases. Because the Bible says man looks on the outside, but God looks on the inside. And Al-Husn al-Ghish wa al-Jamal al says beauty can be deceptive, but the woman who, who trusts the Lord, who gives her life to the Lord, is the one that is praised by God. So as a principle, we should focus on what's inside, not outside. God looks at the inside. But uh, one of the things that I use as a guideline is maybe for a culture, say Western culture, where former Muslims are in the United States or the West, and they have become Christians, I will often say to them, try to use as a guideline dressing like a conservative person in the West. In other words, not pushing the limits of fashion, not looking at everything that's out there on the street, because now we see very skimpy tops, low-cut clothes, mini skirts, um, lots of clothing that is shocking in some ways and, and I know okay maybe I'm a little too easily shocked now because I've spent so much time with Muslims but what do you think about that guideline of dressing on the conservative side of Western culture we're not saying you still have to dress like an American but what do you think of that would that be a, an acceptable guideline you said it perfectly I can add to it I just want to encourage okay. people to think about their image also mm -hmm. We can say, you know, I don't care what people think about me. That's not right. That's not loving. That's not caring. You've got to think of what others think. And you need to be a model of a, of a good Christian decent, decent. The Bible talks about decency. It doesn't give you the measurement of your skirt or your, or your shirt. It's not all about women also. Men can also dress in ways that are not appropriate. So uh, you need to think about other people in a way that would not cause them to stumble. The Bible is very clear about this. Uh, Jesus even said, uh, it's better for you to be drowned in the sea than to cause someone to be stumbled. And I think that is a problem that, that we work with, with Muslim women that are still in Islam. And it's not an easy one. It's like, well, you know, if a man even mm. sees my hand, he's offended. So I, I know yet many women that wear gloves. So. I think that there's a boundary between how easily a man stumbles and how much freedom a woman has, which we could talk about at another time. Somebody but I think recently, that you're saying in general here, our principles should be, we try not to make people stumble. We try to be a good reflection of Christ because we are to mm -hmm. grow in His image. Right. And we should be seen as conservative for the culture and not dress too flashy or focus on 
are physical too much. Is that yeah. pretty much a summary of what you shared with That's us? That's true, here? and I want to add one thing. Someone okay. recently told me, if you dress sexy, you'll receive sex. Hmm. If you dress lovely, you'll get love. Ah. And uh, this is a That's principle. Nice. It's a principle that lovely does not mean you have to show your whole body. You can actually uh, have good fashion, good clothing, nice clothing. It's more attractive than the skin on your, on your body. So uh, I hope this is helpful. So thank you very much, Pastor George, and I'm so glad you were with us here today on Questions Muslims Ask. Not everyone who leaves Islam to become a Christian stays a Christian. This can be a problem and it's a risk that we need to address, especially as those discipling former Muslims. One of the risks is that they would go back into Islam. There's so much family pressure, there's so much cultural pressure. I think for especially the people that go back to the Middle East, if they came to America and learned about the Lord and salvation here, going back puts them under increased pressure and increases their doubts so that they may be inclined to go back. In the past, about seven out of ten Muslims that became a Christian went back to Islam. You can imagine that makes those of us that love Muslims and have been sharing with them scratch our heads and think, what happened? From my perspective, I think I have some insights on that. Let's face it, a lot of the people that changed religions, and in fact in some parts of the world still do change religions, do it for the wrong reasons. They're converting because they get something out of it. Perhaps these people were more open a lot of the time because if you are someone who's been told you are lower than everyone else, you might actually doubt it. There might be something inside of you that says, hey, I'm a human just like you. You're not God. You're just a human. And so those people have their eyes more open and they're suffering and they're looking. So that might be why we've had more people interested in the Christian faith from a background of discrimination and poverty. The pressures that a Muslim comes under are very great when they leave the faith. A lot of them have persecution, and we're not talking just about the kind of persecution that a Christian might have if they become a Muslim. Yes, their families might give them a hard time about it, but I have not heard one convert to Islam ever say they feared for their life. And friends, be honest, you know that when a Muslim converts to the Christian faith, they are, they are risking their lives. In fact, if that final fate were not in store for many of them, we would have mass conversions all over. Please, folks, uh, think about it. If your faith is totally right and it's true before God, why would you need to threaten people into doing it? And if they do it only because they will die if they're not a Muslim, is that sincere? I'm not saying that all Muslims believe in killing people that leave Islam or threatening people into becoming Muslims. But you know, historically across the world, this has happened many times and many Christians have lost their lives. And if they haven't lost their lives, it might have been something less severe. It might have been being outcast from their family. It might have been losing a job. I know Christians that have come to America from the Middle East and other countries because they had no way to continue surviving in their own countries. So I'm saying that there are reasons that a Muslim that becomes a Christian may go back to Islam that have to do with persecution and that have to do with economic pressures. And included in all that is social pressure. Another temptation I have noticed is just license, liberalism, commercialism, and the secular world because to many people in Islam and the Middle East, Christianity is associated with freedom. And we know we have freedom in Christ. We're so happy and blessed that we do. But for some people, they think if I become a Christian, I have freedom. And then once they are a believer, they just want to keep on doing 
secular things and not really get into that close walk with the Lord. And some of them even can fall away because of the attraction of the world, just like the Lord told us in his parable about the different kinds of soil and how the temptations and concerns of the world can draw us away from him. Letters to Hoda. Hoda, here's advice from today's mature Christian friends. Brother Mark is with us today, and I want to ask him a question about a challenge many women from the Middle East face. In fact, I know Huda has faced it. And it's not just for women, it's not just for people in the Middle East. With the financial situations that change in the world on almost a monthly basis, many people face insecurity. How will I survive into the next year, the next month? How will I retire? What if I get sick? All of these looming questions apply to our worry and our sense of insecurity. And Brother Mark, I'm wondering if you could share some words or insights on how to handle insecurity. Well, I do have a sense of insecurity and how I deal with it is one moment at a time, one day at a time. There are many questions we face. What's going to happen tomorrow? What if I do get sick? What if I have a huge bill that I have to pay? Where will the money come from? I have found great relief in just learning to trust God. Find a verse that gives you comfort or faith and what I would say, camp out on that verse. That, that means to just think about that verse, meditate on it, go over it and over and over it in your mind, and you will gradually have a sense of confidence that He is with you. He knows about your insecurities. He knows your concerns and your worries, but He doesn't want you to worry. He wants you to thrive in Him. He says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be yours as well. So he, as, as a reminder, he doesn't want us to worry. He wants us to trust him. So find a verse that you can claim for yourself that speaks to your heart and go over that verse until it becomes almost second nature to think about it word for word. And when you do go over the verse, Focus on one word at a time and just go through the whole verse word by word and focus on one word. For example, where he says, seek first my kingdom, you might think of the word my, or you might think about the word seek, because he does want us to spend time with him, to, to seek him with all our heart and all our soul and to trust him. And then he says, and all these things will be yours as well. He will provide for you. He's Jehovah Jireh, the great provider. He knows what you need before you even ask. And by the time you do get to asking him, he will already be in the process of providing a way out, a way of escape, an answer to your problem, or a word of encouragement for that worry or that concern. Mm -hmm. 